around over a year that we changed a lot in and uh, we continue to go into a year where I think more changes are planned. Uh, we have the pleasure of hosting, uh, um, you know, one of my faculty uh, advisors and in, uh, in fellowship, Dr. Ben Levine from UT Southwestern. Um, Dr. Lampert will take the honor of introducing. Before we do that, I have just one key announcement. Next year, when we start off the Grand Rounds year, and you'll get it in, uh, in email form in multiple forms, we are changing the time of the Grand Rounds to 5 to 6 p.m. on Tuesdays. So the same day, Tuesdays, but 5 to 6 p.m., with the intention that it doesn't overlap with clinical times for other people, both in clinical settings as well as in inpatient setting. Uh, we will actually move the, uh, the reception for the visiting speaker to after the grand rounds. Uh, we used to have that on Monday. It will now be on Tuesdays. Uh, so please watch out. We will send more details, of course, before the session begins. But just as a note that it, the grand rounds will now be 5 to 6 p.m. on Tuesdays. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Lampert. Hi, everyone. I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Ben Levine, my friend and colleague. Dr. Levine graduated from Harvard Medical School and went on to complete residency at Stanford and from there to fellowship at UT Southwestern, where he stayed on since that time and is now a professor of medicine and cardiology. He holds a distinguished professorship in exercise science, as well as endowed chairs in wellness and cardiovascular research. Most importantly, he's the director and founder of the Institute for Exercise and Environmental Medicine, one of the premier, if not the premier, lab for the study of cardiovascular physiology in the country. Dr. Levine's contributions to our understanding of how the cardiovascular system adapts to challenge, whether exercise training or environmental challenge, such as altitude and flight, are unparalleled. As he will describe, his experiences in space medicine are unique, and he serves as a consultant to NASA. Similarly, he's a renowned sports cardiologist and serves as a consultant to the NCAA and multiple professional leagues. Today, he'll be speaking to us about athletes, astronauts, and aging, the adaptive range of human performance. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Levine. Thanks very much, Rachel, and thank you. So nice to see uh, so many people here in person. Um, it's great to be here. I was mentioning I haven't been at Yale since I wrestled against uh, Yale as an undergraduate at Brown in the 1980s, so it's nice to be back. Um, I want to dedicate this talk to my mentors, Gunnar Blomquist and Jerry Mitchell. Um, for the young people in the audience, that really is the key uh, step in your career is to find the right people to mentor you. I also, unfortunately, have to add the loss of a couple of my great colleagues and friends, Jim Stray Gunderson, Fran Rodriguez, who are missed and contributed substantially to many of the things you'll see in this uh, presentation. I want to start with a very famous study. This is the most famous study in our field, the Dallas Bed Rest and Training Study. And in the 1960s, my mentors, Jerry and Gunnar, along with Bank Soltine, took five young men and put them to bed for three weeks and then trained them for two months. And much of what we know about the adaptive capacity of the circulation begins with this study. Um, uh, this slide shows maximal oxygen uptake, but it could be any number of literally hundreds of variables and hundreds of figures. Indeed, uh, this paper published in Circulation in 1968 took up 78 pages of circulation. For those of you who get fussed by reviewers and editors to cut down the size of your papers, we got 78 pages of circulation. Now, I was only 10 years old when this happened, right? Um, but in 1996, along with the um, help of my, my good friend, Darren McGuire, we found those same five guys and brought them back to Dallas now 30 years later. And here's the same data I just showed you before the loss of maximal oxygen uptake or VO2 max after bed rest. And when we brought them back in 1996, not a single person, not one, was in worse shape after 30 years of aging than they were after three weeks of bed rest when they were in their 20s. So three weeks of bed rest was worse than the body's ability to do physical work than 30 years of aging. And that observation has driven much of my work over the last 30 years as well. Now this is maximal oxygen uptake. For those of you who don't think about that, that's VO2 max is what you measure in a CPAT. And performance in endurance sport is predominantly dependent on VO2 max or aerobic power. This is one of 10,000 slides I could show you, which looks at VO2 max 
scale to body mass. This happens to be in a group of female distance runners and their 10K running speed. And it's a very linear relationship. If you wanna compete in 10K, you better have a high VO2 max or you'll run really, really slowly. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go into that physiology. If you'd like to learn more, there's a nice review article that I published uh, in the Special Olympics issue um, of Journal of Physiology just prior to the London Olympics. And it's got a lot of details of that physiology. But I do want to remind you, I'm going to just rewrite the, uh, or rearrange the Fick equation for you. This, most of you will be familiar with the Fick equation, but I've rearranged it to show that oxygen uptake is a function of two things. The, excuse me, the cardiac output times the arterial venous oxygen difference. And it turns out that the vast majority of an increase in uh, having a large oxygen uptake requires a large cardiac output. This paper published in the 1970s illustrates perhaps the most important, single most important uh, take home message in all of exercise science. That is for every liter of oxygen uptake, it takes five or six liters of cardiac output. And Chi Fu and I published these data now, you know, nearly 20 years ago, showing that it doesn't matter if you're sedentary or fit or young or old or a man or a woman or sick or well, it's all the same. Five liters of cardiac output to one liter of oxygen uptake, except for a few small uh, special circumstances which we can discuss if you want. Now the AVO2 difference reflects the ability of the skeletal muscle to extract oxygen as you uh, increase work. And of course the cardiac output is the ability to deliver the oxygen. Cardiac output is a function of heart rate times stroke volume and these are the central factors. Now, if you look at compared athletes to non-athletes, it turns out that athletes have a little bit of an increase in uh, AVO2 difference, but not much. And indeed, the maximal heart rate of an athlete is, if anything, lower than that of a, a non-athlete. So the vast majority of the difference in VO2 max between an athlete and a non-athlete is because they have a large stroke volume. So how do athletes get a large stroke volume? Well, it starts by having a big heart. And here's some data from Jerry Mitchell's lab published now many years ago, looking at left ventricular mass using MRI in a group of competitive athletes, skiers, cyclists, um, and runners compared to a group of sedentary individuals. And this is data um, in absolute terms. These are data scaled to lean body mass. So since runners are typically the smallest of this group of athletes, they have the highest mass scale to body mass. And uh, this, these filled bars are the data for men, but Maggie Riley Hagen published the same data in women showing exactly the same thing. That is that if you, the athletes, female athletes have larger hearts than male athletes, even when scaled to body mass though, male hearts are bigger than female hearts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as this uh, uh, talk goes along. So why is it good to have a big heart? Typically, we think about having left ventricular hypertrophy as a bad thing, right? That it, it's associated with the disease, but not with athletes. And in fact, the first study that I ever published uh, during my fellowship was this one we published in Circulation, where we actually quantified left ventricular starling curves and pressure volume curves in a group of elite athletes. And to do that, we had to come up with a method in healthy people to do it. And so what we did is we took healthy young individuals, we put a right heart cath in from an antecubital vein to measure pressure. We used 3D echo to measure volume. We unloaded the heart with a technique called lower body negative pressure. So that lowers the filling pressure of the heart by sucking blood into the feet. And then we gave a rapid saline infusion up to 30 mLs per kg. Um, very fast, 200 mLs a minute to expand, to increase the filling pressure. And we were then able to generate these starling curves in elite athletes shown here in yellow and in healthy sedentary medical students shown here in white. And you can see that the, that the athletes have a much larger stroke volume for the same filling pressure that the sedentary individuals do. Now, I'm not going to show you data. Trust me, contractile function is exactly the same. So this is not because the athletes are squeezing better, but I'm gonna now take this curve and flip it on its side. And now I'm gonna show you the diastolic limb of a pressure volume curve. And I'm gonna show you lots 
of curves that look like this over the next 40 minutes or so with volume on the x-axis and pressure on the y-axis. So curves that are shifted downward and to the right are more compliant, upward and to the left is stiffer. So for any given filling pressure, the hearts of the athletes are much larger than the non-athletes and their hearts are more compliant. That's what allows them to have that big stroke volume to fill and pump to be able to have a high VO2 max. But you might argue with me that, well, maybe in order to be a good athlete, you have to have a big compliant heart. Maybe this has nothing to do with training and everything to do with genetics. So to test the hypothesis, we said, okay, let's see if we can take these sedentary people and turn them into marathon runners. And to do that, we trained a group of men and women for a year to become marathon runners. And to do that, we, we train them using typical elite athlete training paradigms. And we quantified the training using something called a TRIM, stands for training impulse. The details don't really matter. We took the average heart rate during a training session, multiplied it by the duration of the training session, and then weighted it for exercise intensity. And we increased that over the course of the year. In the first three months, we started pretty easy with brisk walking, slow jogging, about 30 minutes, three to five times a week. And for those, just for a comparison, a typical cardiac rehab program gets you about a thousand trips a month. So that's where we're starting. But over the course of the year, we increased the duration and the frequency and the intensity so that by the end of the year, they were training seven to nine hours a week with 45 minute to one hour base runs, up to three hour long runs, thresholds, interval and races. And a typical collegiate 5K uh, middle distance runner trains about 3000 trims a month. So we, we got pretty close to what the athletes were doing. So what happened to these individuals over that year? Well, um, the next few slides are set up the same way. We, this is VO2 max. And we measured them at three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. And as you'd expect, they got fitter. Big surprise, right? That means at least we're good coaches. But what happened to their heart? So we turned to a cardiac MRI and we measured their left ventricular mass to demonstrate this evolution of the athlete's heart. And you can see that left ventricular mass goes up. The biggest increase actually occurred in those first three months. So a big increase in left ventricular mass, about a 40% increase. Now, MRI is good because it also allows us to look at right ventricular masses. Now, the RV is a little bit challenging. You all know it's a much smaller uh, chamber. So the scale is very different here, but the relative change is the same. So you can see that the RV hypertrophy is at least as much, if not more, than the left ventricle. So, so how, what about that balance between uh, mass and volume? Well, here's the data for left ventricular volume. And I gotta tell you, this shocked me. I really thought left ventricular volume was gonna get bigger right away, which was endurance training. And in fact, it didn't. It didn't start to get bigger until much later in the training program. Now, this is a, it, I've got this scale this way on purpose because the right ventricle is the one that really increased its volume. In fact, I think that right ventricular dilation may be permissive, that you've got to enlarge the right ventricle to be able to support the increase in work coming from the left ventricle. So RV goes first, followed by left ventricle. Now, if I put the volume and mass on the same slide, um, this is left ventricular volume. Remember that left ventricular volume really hardly increased but wall thickness increased a lot, at least at those first three months. And it wasn't until we increased the duration, frequency, and intensity that LV volume went up. Now I've expanded the scale here to see it a little easier. And if anything, wall thickness started to go down. That's the evolution of the athlete's heart, uh, eccentric hypertrophy. Now, obviously the heart just can't keep getting bigger forever. Right? It's got to, there's got to be some limit to that. And Antonio Policia and his group who study a lot of Olympic athletes with ECHO has this very nice study published in uh, 2010, looking at a group of Olympic athletes who competed in multiple Olympiads over decades. And here's one individual who competed in four Olympiads over 12 years. 
and you can see this is the M mode measurements of left ventricular and diastolic and end systolic dimensions. They are virtually identical over 12 years. Now, why should that be? Why doesn't the heart continue to get bigger as you continue to train? And let me give you a little bit of insight from a more recent study that we published led by Aaron Howden, now at the Baker Institute. And Aaron took 60 middle-aged adults in their 50s and trained them for two years incorporating high intensity interval training. And we've got two groups here. The left-hand side will be our controls who did yoga, which makes people feel good, but doesn't make them fitter. So it's a really good control. And then our group of um, uh, middle-aged individuals who got fitter. And interestingly, we increased the load over the first year and then kept it the same over the second year. So we didn't continue to increase the load. And they got fitter in that first year and didn't get any fitter, even though they kept doing the same thing over and over and over again for another year. And here's our data comparing a group of um, elite uh, masters triathletes of the same age. What about left ventricular volumes? They don't change if you do yoga. And they show the same pattern as the VO2 max. LV volume gets bigger, and then it doesn't continue to get bigger doing the same thing over and over again without changing the load doesn't make the heart bigger and doesn't make you fitter. What was really interesting though and surprised me is that when we looked at the atria, the atria continued to get bigger. So here's the, again, nothing changes if you do yoga, but the left atrium got bigger and then continued to get bigger as we continue to train. In fact, many of them achieved the same atrial size as our competitive athletes maybe raising the, providing some explanation for why uh, endurance athletes develop atrial fibrillation. Now, if you wanna read a little bit more about the physiologic hypertrophy or exercise-induced adaptations, I refer you to this state-of-the-art review we published a couple of years ago in JAK, which emphasizes that the nature of the hypertrophy um, of the athlete's heart depends on the relative contribution of dynamic or endurance training versus static or strength training with the biggest hearts coming in those athletes like competitive rowers who do a combination of both strength and endurance training. Now, how did we do in our training in terms of the adaptation compared to our cross-sectional data. So here's the data I showed you before, left ventricular mass in athletes and sedentary individuals. Our, um, uh, our men got up to the same left ventricular mass that the athletes did, as did our women. So clearly we did something to generate this uh, cardiac hypertrophy in these individuals. Well, what about the function? Here's the starling curves. I showed you these before, sedentary individuals and elite athletes. And here's the data longitudinally, the baseline and training. Notice an increase in stroke volume for any given filling pressure coming pretty close to what we saw in the athletes. Now you might think then that that meant we got the same cardiac compliance, but surprisingly we didn't. Here's the pressure volume curves pre and post training compared to a group of elite male athletes. Yeah, the heart gets a little bit bigger and the equilibrium volume gets a little bit bigger, but nowhere near the same size as the elite athletes cross-sectionally. And that's a little bit confusing to me. Um, I don't know why that should be. Maybe, maybe you, you have to train while you're growing to get the biggest size heart. Maybe you need to train for more than one or two years. Maybe you need to do five or 10 to stretch the pericardium and get that maximal LV volume. But uh, clearly we didn't achieve that same cardiac compliance that we see in the elite athletes. Now you notice that these are just male athletes. And that's because I never did right heart casts in elite female athletes. So the question then is, do males and females adapt to training the same way? And yeah, certainly the skeletal muscle does, right? We can see that that's pretty obvious in these two groups of elite bodybuilders, skeletal muscle hypertrophy is much more. Now I'm coming here to the Ivy League to give this talk where it's quite controversial, right? Because this is Leah Thomas, who uh, swims or swam for the University of Pennsylvania um, as a woman. And she swam as Matthew Thomas for the same team, 
for the University of Pennsylvania swimming team when uh, before she transitioned um, uh, from a male to a female. Now, for those of you who are not sure whether there should be separate categories for men and women in sports, let me show you a couple of videos to prove my point. This video here is the longest standing world record extant men. Schon nach einer Runde haben sich im 800 Meter Lauf der Frauen die Fronten geklärt. Jarmila Gratochvilova, die Spezialistin über 400 Meter, liegt ganz klar in Führung. Petra Kleinbram hat sich für das Tempo geopfert auf den ersten 400 Metern, fällt jetzt zurück, liegt im Moment noch an zweiter Stelle, wird im Moment passiert von Margret Klinger aus Obersuhl und in deren Schlepp Jolanta Januchta aus Polen. Now, obviously, remember that in 19. Ha, ein riesen Vorsprung für Jarmila Kratochvilova. Und das scheint auch eine hervorragende Zeit zu werden. Da gibt es denn das. Da ist jeglicher Kontakt zur Konkurrenz abgerissen. 50 Meter, vielleicht mögen es 60 Meter sein, die sie Vorsprung hat. Na, da bin ich mal gespannt, was das für eine Zeit werden wird. Okay, I want to show you one more, and this is the first mixed relay. Well, she's got a lot of work to do to close the gap. Can Justina Spiti Ursetic hang on for Poland be to have because she will be competing first. against seven men? This woman is in the mixed the relay. Backs. This is the last lap. The inaugural she champions to be crowned. Spiti Ursetic. And it's Michael Watch Cherry, what happens when Michael Cherry storming round that US bend trying to close the gap. Javon Francis is in third place for the Jamaicans. Again, an Olympic gold medal. And look at the speed with which and Cherry takes the Polish woman. My, my point is that there should be no debate on whether in order for women to be successful, they have to have a protected category. What's the data about how women's hearts adapt differently to men to a year of training. And I told you that in our study, we had both men and women training. And in fact, we matched them perfectly, heartbeat for heartbeat over a year of training. The trims for the men in yellow and the women in white were completely matched. But what happened to them over the year of training? Here's the VO2 max data for the men, three, six, nine, and 12 months for the men. And here's the data for the women a nice increase in the first three months, and then it plateaued. Now, you could say, well, the men were a little fitter, maybe that's the reason, but so, we, we chose particularly fit and particularly tall women to try to match them as best we can. And just as an example, here's one man and woman who started with exactly the same VO2 max, and the man increased dramatically, and the woman increased and then plateaued. How about LV mass? Now it's scaled to lean body mass. LV mass increases progressively in the men, increases nicely in the first three months in women, and then plateaus, does not increase further. And if I take a woman and a man and a woman who start with exactly the same LV mass, we see exactly the same pattern. Hypertrophy in the man, minimal hypertrophy uh, in the woman. How about the Starling curves? We see a nice increase from baseline to training, an increase in stroke volume in the men, and a much smaller increase in stroke volume in the women compared to the men. The pressure volume curves are shown here. This is the women pre and post and the men pre and post. I showed you these before. You see a nice rightward curve in both, but Notice that the equilibrium volume, that's down here, the volume in the heart when pressure equals zero, hardly changes in the women and increases dramatically in the men. So clearly there's something different that's causing remodeling in the male hearts than the female hearts. Well, what about transgender individuals? And it turns out that we have some data regarding people who have transitioned. And that comes from the US Air Force. We may never be able to get such data again if, if the current, uh, uh, Congress and Supreme Court get their way, but at least uh, and during this period of time, the U.S. Air Force actually did gender-affirming therapy um, in uh, individuals who were transgender in the Air Force, and they studied, this group studied 46 trans women, that's XY genetics receiving feminizing hormones, and 29 trans men, XX 
genetics receiving masculinizing hormones. This is gender affirming therapy. And here's the data for both push-ups and 1.5 mile runtime. So let's look at the push-ups for a minute. These are the dash line. That's the data for the male controls and the female controls. The men do more push-ups than the women. The transgender women start looking out um, like male controls before they get their feminizing hormone. And they start to get less strong, closer to the female controls after two, and a half, two years or more of hormone therapy. On the other hand, look at the one and a half mile runtime. This is reversed, right? So if, you're, if the male controls are down here lower because lower is faster, right? And look at the, and the, the, so the men are faster than the women. The transgender women get slower, but nowhere near as slow as the female control. So even two years of gender affirming therapy does not normalize performance between men and women. If you'd like to read more about this, uh, Joanna Harper, who is a transgender cyclist herself, just got her PhD at Loughborough University in the UK, has written a very nice review about transgender therapy. Now, it's not all bad, if you will, for transgender women. It turns out that women hardly die. You know, this is the 550,000 finishers, at least during exercise, sorry. Um, the 550,000 finishers of the Twin Cities and Marine Corps marathons over uh, over 27 years. And you can see that the participation in women markedly increases. And here's the sudden deaths, right? Between 2000 and 2009, there were no sudden deaths in women. Can somebody tell me, Roman, how do you get a p-value with it? no women dying? I don't understand that, but I didn't review the paper. And, and you know, if you look at all the 2,500 uh, sudden cardiac deaths during sport that Barry Marin had published, only 11% of those are women. Now, there are other co complications, if you will, of having a smaller heart. And Erica knows I spend a lot of time studying this particular group of individuals, that patients with the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And orthostatic tolerance, intolerance, and POTS is much more common in women than in men. Um, that's a whole talk in and of itself, but I wanna show you just one set of data, which I think is instructive. So here's the data for heart rate at baseline during a low level tilt, and then over 45 minutes of 60 degree upright tilt, that gets you 90% of the upright gradient. Here's the data for healthy men, and in pink is the data for healthy women, and green are the data for patients with POTS. So patient, women have higher heart rates than men, and patients with POTS have much higher heart rates. That's what defines the syndrome. If you're paying any attention to me, you'll suspect that what I'm gonna show you next is the stroke volume data, right? Because that's what's regulated. And in fact, it's a perfect mirror image. So this stroke volume at baseline is higher in men, lower in women, and much lower in patients with POTS. And if you take a patient with POTS and you stand them upright for 40 minutes, their hearts are about the size of a grape. It's a, the stroke volume is tiny. That's why their heart rates are so high. And if I make their hearts bigger and expand their blood and plasma volume, the syndrome goes away. So I tell my EP colleagues, this is appropriate rather than inappropriate tachycardia. And if you give these patients drugs to slow the heart rate, most of the time it just makes them feel worse because this is appropriate tachycardia. Now, what this means is that POTS is fundamentally a gravity disease. And I got into this business studying astronauts and UT Southwestern has had a long, year, uh, long career of studying uh, spaceflight and cardiovascular medicine in flight. And one of the first things that was discovered about um, the space program is that about a quarter to two thirds of astronauts can't stand for more than 10 minutes when they come back from being in space. They lose the ability to tolerate the upright posture. Why should that be? Well, it, just let me remind you that standing in front of you, gravity is sucking blood into my feet. In fact, three quarters of my blood volume is below the heart. But if I take this upright human and send them into space, all this blood now shifts up into the central circulation, right? 
And the astronauts like to call that the puffy face bird leg syndrome because the face and the upper part of the body get full and the legs get narrow. Um, and it turns out that that's a perfectly normal adaptation. What happens then is the body gets rid of that fluid in the upper body and the adaptive posture is some way about halfway between supine and standing. That's what all the various hemodynamics end up while you're in space, which is just fine when you're in space. But when you come back down to earth, now you're relatively unloaded and the heart rate goes up and people, the astronauts get orthostatic intolerance. Now, at least that's the theory. One of my favorite quotes from the great detector Sherlock Holmes says, there's nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. Remember that. Uh, trainees, right? Nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. So to address this issue, we had to test the hypothesis that central venous pressure and filling pressure would go up in space. So we developed this technique. You guys have probably seen pick lines in the hospital. A lot of that technology came from the development of putting a catheter in an astronaut. It was the most expensive catheter in the history of the world, probably about $8 million for this one catheter, which I ended up putting in Drew Gaffney um, in uh, the early 1990s. And here's the data from that uh, experiment. This is the CVP with Dr. Gaffney sitting upright in the suit room, lying in the orbiter with his legs up. So CVP goes up and then he spends a couple of hours in the orbiter peeing in his diaper and CVP goes down and then the shuttle takes off. And there's a lot of noise because it's, he's on top of an exploding rocket. And, you can, and then boom, all of a sudden he goes into space and CVP goes to zero. CVP went to zero. That's not what we hypothesized, but not only did CVP go down, but the heart got bigger. These are echo data from a series of astronauts. The time scale is a little different, right? This is pre-flight and the first day, the heart's about 20% bigger. And then eventually it gets smaller. So how can pressure go down, but the heart get bigger? Who are the hemodynamicists in the room? We have some hemodynamicists in this Yale Division of Cardiology. So not very many, at least not here in the grand rounds, right? So um, there's really only one way that can happen. And I wanna remind you of the importance of external constraint, the weight of the chest wall and the lungs that literally compresses the heart. And the, the pressure that causes cardiac distension is the intracardiac pressure minus pleural pericardial pressure. And if I send people up and I measure esophageal pressure, it turns out that intrathoracic pressure goes down even more than intracardiac pressure. So transmural pressure, that distending pressure goes up. And what happens then is you fundamentally change the pressure volume characteristics of the chamber. So this is a stiff chamber with the heart weighing and pressing on it. And this is what happens when you take all that weight off the chest. So the heart gets bigger, but the pressure goes down. The only way to do that is changing the compliance characteristics of the heart. Why is this important? Why am I wasting your time talking about this very unique and special problem? Well, it affects every pressure measurement that's reported to you in cath lab. Okay, here's some data from a Cleveland Clinic Group published in CHESS just last year, which looks at the wedge pressure and esophageal pressure. This is during normal respiration. I mean, it, it, Pressure goes up and changes a lot when you inspire and expire, right? What, is the, what do you guys do in your cath lab? Do they average it over the respiratory cycle? They report end expiration? I bet they don't tell you. Even in my lab, they don't tell me which it is. And if each attending does something a little different. But it just shows you how dramatically important that is. But if you subtract one from the other, you can see that it changes relatively little because it's intrathoracic pressure that changes so much. And if you sit somebody up, you can see that, that the pressures go way down by taking some of that pressure off the chest. Now, Mike Nelson uh, and his group are just publishing some data um, in a group of our HEFPEF patients showing that if you quantify the amount of fat, this is pericardial and epicardial, and together it makes pericardial fat, that those who that have a lot of fat end up with a very eccentric D-shaped heart. And here's the data. Focus on this one on the right-hand side, that those individuals who have um, an eccentric heart 
that is a, a index AP to septolateral dimension that's greater than one have much more per pericardial fat than those who have normal ones. Now we've come up with a way to try to pull that fat off the chest. This is called a cuirass device. It's kind of like an iron lung. And if you stick it on someone and hook it up to a vacuum cleaner, you can suck the, chest, the fat and lift the chest wall up. And when you do that, the wedge pressure goes down and the right atrial pressure goes down. In some people, the transmural pressure, that's uh, right atrial pressure minus wedge actually goes up. And most of you know that the diagnostic criteria for HEFPEF is an elevated pressure during exercise. Well, look what happens during exercise in these individuals. Here's the wedge pressure just during 20 watts of upright exercise, right? And if we use the caress, we reduce it by more than the average of those transeptal devices, which don't work at all. And stroke volume went up as you take the fat off the chest. So this effect of the external constraint is really important. Now, what happens when I take those astronauts who've been exposed to zero gravity and keep them in space for a few years and then bring them back down to Earth? And I'm gonna, the sine qua non of space flight is a low stroke volume in the upright position. So let me show you some data about that. This is uh, NASA parlance, L minus 60 means launch minus 60 days. And here's the stroke volume. This is what happens normally when you go from supine to upright tilt, five and 10 minutes of upright tilt. And there's a very reproducible response. If we do it two, 60 days or 15 days before flight, we see the same response in the same individuals. But on landing day, after three weeks in space, notice that supine stroke volume is lower, but upright stroke volume is lower still much lower, 50% lower than it was before. So what happens to the neural regulation when you decrease the stroke volume? Well, I'll tell you that heart rate goes up a lot. It actually meets criteria for POTS in some patients, but I wanna show you some very unique data. Do you all know what microneurography is, sympathetic nerve recordings? The, the, the perineal nerve passes right by the fibular head. And if you take a little acupuncture needle and stick it in the perineal nerve, you can record signals, sympathetic nerve signals from the brain to the blood vessels. And that's what this is here. This is a micronographic signal. Each one of these spikes is a burst of efferent sympathetic activity, which causes release of norepinephrine. And here's the data for stroke volume on the x-axis and how many sympathetic bursts on the y-axis. So when you go from supine to upright tilt before flight, you get a decrease in stroke volume and an increase in sympathetic nerve activity. What happens after space flight? Well, here's our post-flight recording on the same individual. Now supine stroke volume is lower, upright stroke volume is lower still, and sympathetic nerve activity is through the roof, right? But it's proportional to the reduction in stroke volume exactly what we saw in the POTS patients, right? This is a change in gravity and a change in stroke volume. So if stroke volume is so important, what happens to cardiac mechanics after space flight? Well, I don't have space flight. I didn't do right, full right heart casts and pressure volume curves after flight, but we do use bed rest as a model for space flight. So here's the Starling curves that I showed you before, wedge pressure versus stroke volume, an increase in stroke volume in, uh, after training compared to baseline, right? And here's what happens after bed rest. Yellow is pre-bed rest, white is post-bed rest. And I'll tell you, this shocked me. I'm quite surprised. I really thought that you'd simply fall off on the same Starling curve. And for the trainees in the room, I want you to remember that it's the things that you don't expect that are really most interesting. And so don't ever be afraid of coming to your mentors with something that they didn't expect because that's really when we learn the most. And so you can see that you actually fall off the Starling curve. How could that be? Well, let's take a look then about their pressure volume curves. I promise you that contractile function didn't change. So here's bed rest data after three weeks of bed rest, volume, and wedge pressure with a leftward shift in the pressure volume curve. It's small, but it's real. Now, when I showed these curves to my friend, John Tyberg, the late and great hemodynamicist from Calgary, he said, ah, this is just what happens when you unload the heart. This has nothing to do with adaptation. So he said, okay, let's bring those same guys back a year later and give them a diuretic. 
to lose the same amount of plasma volume that they lost after bed rest. And here's those data. This is after giving a dose of Lasix acutely. And what you see is these curves are superimposable. In particular, I want you to focus on the equilibrium volume. That's the volume in the heart when pressure equals zero. If I take the heart out of the chest, plop it on the table, that's the equilibrium volume, right? And that's the volume below which you have to contract in systole to engage restorative forces. So clearly the heart is remodeling during bed rest where it doesn't just by acutely unloading it. So let's take a look at the MRI in our bed rest patients. So um, this is the inverse of the athlete's heart. This is physiologic atrophy. We call it the couch potato's heart. Left ventricular mass goes down a little bit at two weeks, but after six weeks in bed, it goes down a lot more. And the morph morphologic change is very similar to what we saw uh, or inverse to what we see with training. We see a huge reduction in volume acutely, right? With no change in wall thickness. Then between two and six weeks, volume goes down just a little bit more, but wall thickness goes down a lot. So the heart shrinks and then to normalize wall stress, you start to get remodeling. Now I convinced three of these guys to stay in bed for another six weeks. That's 12 weeks in bed, about three months. You can't get out of bed even to go to the bathroom, right? This is 12 weeks of bed rest. And, and so here's the data for 12 weeks of bed rest. Wow. Yeah, How, do we have any volunteers for our next seven <laughs> So here's the LV mass of the two, six and 12 weeks of bed rest. Notice that there's just a steady reduction. There's no evidence of a plateau, right? About 1% a week in multiple studies that we've done. And in order to, to try to put a lot of those studies on the same graph and to show, show you this adaptive range, the title of my talk, um, I wanna put the data with bed rest in yellow and training in white. The baseline data shown in this open uh, bar at 100% of baseline. And here's what we see with bed rest, two, six, eight, 12 weeks of bed rest. We're training three, six, nine, 12 months of training. That's a third of the heart's muscle mass longitudinally is adaptable, responsive to changes in physical activity. And if I ask what's the outer range of that, if I take it, someone who's been spinal cord injured, who hasn't moved in more than two years, they have about a 25% reduction in LV mass compared to baseline. And elite runners um, have about a 50% increase. That's 75% of the heart's muscle mass is adaptable. That's quite remarkable. But if you put these on the same graph, it makes you wonder what would happen if you did this while you did this? What if you trained people while you were in bed? So we did that. And to do that, we used rowing. I mean, for a couple of reasons. Number one, you can do it while you're sitting down, right? But rowers have the biggest hearts of any athletes. And every time you pull on the oars, you have this huge increase in arterial pressure. So huge increase in loading. And so we did that and we put people to bed for five weeks and randomly assigned them to rowing or not rowing. So here's the data. You should be used to seeing my pressure volume curves by now, pressure and volume. This is pre-bed rest and post-bed rest, a quite prominent leftward shift of the pressure volume curve after uh, five weeks of lying in bed doing nothing. What happens if you row while you're in bed? Absolutely nothing. Completely prevented. Completely prevented any cardiovascular adaptation. For, for those of you who, who ascribe to the sedentary behavior hypothesis, I will tell you rowing for 30 minutes a day, even while people were doing absolutely nothing, completely prevented any evidence of deconditioning completely prevented it in every way that we can think of. And this completely eliminated orthostatic intolerance. Now these data are only five weeks of bed rest. Currently NASA sends astronauts in space for a lot longer. I mean, six months, soon to be in a year. So we studied 13 astronauts um, after six months in space. Now I will tell you that on average, the amount of training exercise that they do in space actually seem to prevent atrophy on average, but there was a lot of variability. And let me show you, this is um, the data. And, and of course, these astronauts have given me permission to show their faces. This is left ventricular volume and mass in our fittest astronaut, pre-flight and post-flight. So he had about an 11% uh, decrease in left ventricular mass 
um, which was about half what we expected to see after six months in space. So training helped, but wasn't perfect. Contrast that with our least fit astronaut. She didn't do anything on the ground, right? Completely sedentary. She actually did so much exercise in space that she developed physiologic hypertrophy, an increase in LV mass and an increase in LV volume. So that's physiologic hypertrophy in an untrained astronaut. Now, we're gonna, these data are about to be published in, in Jack. They've been accepted and Dennis Wakeham has tried to put all these data on, on the same graph for all these astronauts. And it turns out that we quantified cardiac work over 24 hours. And the amount of the change in LV mass was absolutely proportionate to the change in cardiac work between pre-flight and in-flight. So this is a typical, just normal biologic response to change in cardiac loading. Now, I'm gonna come back to the beginning of my talk and ask you this question. If three weeks of bed rest is worse than 30 years of aging, could spaceflight be a model for accelerated aging? And in fact, NASA has proposed that. That was one of the reasons, let's put aside the political ones for a moment, while they flew John Glenn back into space 40 years after his first flight a few years ago. And this, is, this, this concept has served as the foundation for a lot of my NIH-funded work, looking at the effect of sedentary aging. And to address this question, we, we found a group of um, healthy seniors and divided them into athletes. They had to be over age 65. The athletes had to be training for more than 25 years more than 20 miles a week and be competitive at a national or regional level. It was actually pretty easy to recruit these guys, much harder to find completely sedentary and healthy people. That means less than 30 minutes a day, less than three days a week. And what do you think the cardiac compliance was in these individuals? Well, here's the pressure volume curves. This slide shows transmural pressure. That's the difference between LA and RA, but it's the same concept, volume and pressure. Here's a group of our healthy young individuals, and here's our healthy seniors. Look at that dramatic leftward and upward shift, the stiffening of the heart um, with sedentary, healthy, but sedentary aging. Now, this is age 30, and this is age 70. So when in the aging process does this happen? So Naoki Fujimoto looked at more than 100 individuals across that lifespan, brought them in from the Dallas Heart Study and showed that it was between youth and late middle age that you had this initial upward and stiffening of the heart. And then from late middle age to seniors, mid 50s to 70s, you get this atrophy and shrinking of the heart. That's the aging process. Now, what do you think our master's athletes look like? Undifferentiated from the healthy young individuals. So lifelong training preserves youthful myocardial compliance, which is really important scientifically, but not a very good public health measure, right? It's hard to tell your patients, oh my God, you should have been training your whole life, right? <laughs> so, um, so the next question we had to ask is, well, how much exercise do you need to do over a lifetime to preserve cardiac compliance. So to answer that question, we turned to our colleagues at the Cooper Clinic and we identified people who over a 20 year period had answered the physical activity questions exactly the same. And we divided them into four groups, a group of uh, sedentary individuals who train less than two days a week, a group of who we called casual exercisers who did two to three days a week over a lifetime, committed exercisers four to five days a week, and master's athletes, another group of master's athletes. And look at, if I just compare this group with this group, you can see that it recapitulates the same thing I just showed you before in a completely different group of individuals. Unfortunately, two to three days a week did absolutely nothing for cardiac compliance. It's not gonna help. It may have other benefits, but it's not gonna prevent cardiac stiffening. Four to five days a week, um, got you most of the way there, but not completely as much as the master athletes. So, you know, that's a little bit disappointing. And the question though is, is this reversible? Can I take somebody who spent their whole life being sedentary and change their cardiac compliance? So we took a group of our sedentary seniors and we trained them for a year um, using the same paradigm we did in our young individuals. 
And yeah, we're pretty good trainers. We made them fitter for sure. They increased their VO2 max over three, six, nine, and 12 months of training, but their cardiac compliance didn't change at all. Here's our uh, master's athletes, uh, pre-training in the filled circles, post-training in the open circles. Not one whit of a change after a year of training. That's kind of a bummer, right? So what, what would happen if we started younger, like aim for that sweet spot, that late middle age, and train them longer? So let me come back to Aaron Howden's study. I showed you that the VO2 max and the LV volumes and the left atrial volumes. Here's their cardiac compliance. And remember, we divided them into a group that did exercise and a group that did yoga. And at baseline, they were essentially the same. A year of yoga did absolutely nothing, but a year of training, two years, excuse me, of high intensity intervals got these patients a dramatic reversal of the effects of sedentary aging. And I just want to brag a little bit. I just checked this the other day. The outmetric score for this particular paper is uh, 2200, which is number 10 for circulation ever, ever. So people are very interested in this. Um, I, we've been talking, we talked a little bit about HEFPEF, but so, so let me ask the question, can you take patients who are kind of in that, heading in that direction, left ventricular hypertrophy and elevated biomarkers, elevated troponin or NTBMP? Michi Hieda showed that those patients with LVH actually have stiffer hearts than healthy controls. And when he took them and he trained them for a year, we had, yoga didn't do anything, but now we've got a nice reduction in uh, LV compliance, improvement in LV compliance. So let me give you a few take home messages from this talk. Number one, the heart exhibits substantial morphologic and functional plasticity in response to physical activity. Athletic training induces physiologic hypertrophy and increases cardiac compliance to a greater degree in males than females. The heart atrophies and stiffens with age and physical inactivity, such as bed rest or space flight. Some aspects of this process may be prevented by lifelong training at the right dose, um, which might forestall deconditioning diseases like HEFPEF. The heart of the senior athlete with a lifelong pattern of intensive training is youthfully compliant, equivalent to healthy 30 year olds and their large blood cell, I didn't show you this, but their large blood vessels also have a biologic age about 30 years younger than their chronologic age. Four to five days a week over a lifetime may be enough to acquire most, though not all of those benefits. <clears throat> There's probably a sweet spot in late middle age during which the heart and large blood vessels retain that plasticity in response to training. This is the ideal time to intervene in high risk patients and may be a useful strategy to prevent a variety of age related diseases. And if you're interested, this is my exercise prescription for life. Um, four to five days a week of some physical activity Pick one day a week, do it for an hour and do something that might be fun. I don't care what that is. Uh, just do it for an hour, two to three days a week of something moderate intensity, enough to make you a little shorter breath, get a little sweat on your brow. Uh, the, the talk test, I like to say, you can talk, but you can't sing. That's the intensity. And then one day a week of something high intensity. I don't care how you do that. There are a lot of different ways to skin that cat. And then one, at least one or two days a week of strength training. And it doesn't have to be pumping iron. It can be strength yoga or anything like that. And that's my prescription for life. Um, if you don't mind, I want to take the speaker's prerogative and leave, leave you with just a little bit of philosophy, if that's OK, Eric. Um, and I, this picture was one of my favorite pictures that NASA has ever published. And um, Carl Sagan, the great astronomer, <clears throat> said about this picture, there's no sign of humans in this picture, not our reworking of the Earth's surface, <clears throat> excuse me, not our machines, not our cells. From this vantage point, our obsession with nationalism is nowhere in evidence. The Apollo pictures of the whole Earth, whole Earth convey to multitudes something well known to astronomers. On scale of worlds, to say nothing of stars or galaxies, humans are inconsequential a thin film of life on an obscure and solitary lump of rock and metal. But in 1977, the Voyager spacecraft left the Earth and went out through the solar system. And in the early 90s, it passed through Pluto. And Sagan convinced NASA engineers to turn the cameras around and take a picture of the Earth 
back in through the Milky Way from Pluto. And that's this, that's the Earth. And what Sagan said about that, he said, look, for us, it's different. Look at that dot, that's here, that's home, that's us. Honored everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hero and coward, every mother and father, every superstar, supreme leader, saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a mode of dust dispended in the sunbeam. Think of all the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. There is perhaps no demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, Carl Sagan, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So with that, I'll stop and be happy to answer any questions. Wow, what a talk. Uh, questions? Uh, ben, that was an outstanding talk and congrats on all your work. Welcome back. I hope your visit this time was less stressful than when you came as a wrestler in college. <laughs> um, so a question that I'm sure you get a lot is the distinction between pathologic and physiologic hypertrophy. And you, you're you're mentioning an increased compliance in HFPATH patients with exercise might mitigate my question a little bit, but the three month increase in LV mass and compliance in those who exercise train, what's the mechanism of that at the cellular level? Because, you know, pathologic hypertrophy, obviously the compliance isn't there. So is there something intrinsic? Is there even hyperplasia of the cardiomyocytes? I no, I, heard I, of that, it's a but... great question, Jeff. And I think that, you know, we, there's a lot we can learn from animal models, of course. You know, and Leslie Lanouan's got this python. You know, I don't know if you guys know that, that if you give a python something to eat, like its heart gets big. And then when it stops eating, it shrinks. And there's a lot of the work about the mechanisms of physiologic versus pathologic hypertrophy come from that model. And, and, and I think that my sense of this is that the cardiac compliance is determined by two things, right? The left ventricular mass, the biologic myocyte, which is relatively compliant, and the connected tissue matrix, which is not. And it's the balance between those two that determines the stiffness. And so what I think exercise training does is it maximizes the myocyte volume. And we know that you don't necessarily add myocytes in series, but you make them bigger. And, and I think that provides, that's what increases the compliance, more myocyte and less uh, connected tissue. Mike Zile and George Cooper in South Carolina did those studies with, um, with dogs and they would cause, induce mitral regurgitation and cause hyper, uh, hypertrophy and then fix it and cause atrophy. And there's a lot of good basic science about that. So, but I think that much of that is the balance between myocyte volume and connected tissue metrics. I'm gonna start. I really enjoyed very much uh, your talk. And so there are two unrelated questions. One is that uh, <laughs> you mentioned about cause and many of these patients have EDS, Erdandos syndrome and collagen mutation. So I wonder actually, this is a matter of compliance because of that. And then you nicely showed actually, actually every genetic changes can actually overcome the genetic changes that is really these patients have. And do we know anything about that? So, I think, so right, but the second question is that there is some controversy about extreme exercise and coronary calcification. Mm. And I don't know if that's been your observation and what you say about that. All right, well, it depends on which question you want me to address first. <laughs> So, so let's talk, well, let me pull up something for you here because um, I, I was prepared for that question. So I'm gonna to talk to you first about the coronary calcium and then I'll talk about the EDS stuff, right? So, so we've been very involved in this space and um, some data that we acquired with the Cooper Clinic again, 22,000 people adjusted for age, smoking, BMI, et cetera. And we divided them into two groups, three groups, right? One group did less than 1,500 minutes per week, 
averaging less than about an hour of physical activity. Another group did more than 3,000 net minutes a week. That's a lot of physical activity. More than eight hours per week. And then a group in the middle. And about, there was about an 11% increase in the prevalence of coronary calcium greater than 100. Now be careful about interpreting that data. And I wanna show you why. Because here's the clear data. Now, that has nothing to do with outcomes, right? So we, we studied these 22,000 people so we could give you some data about outcomes. So here's the data though, in about three quarters of our cohort had a calcium score less than 100 and about 25% had a calcium score more than 100. In our most frequent group, the calcium score between low and high physical activity, no difference at all. Even in the group that had a calcium score greater than 100, there wasn't a greater amount of coronary calcium there was a greater risk, a small greater risk of having a calcium greater than 100, but no greater total calcification burden. So higher amounts of physical activity are not associated with greater calcium, but I promised you uh, outcomes. So here's the 25% who have a coronary calcium score greater than 100, and the hazard ratio for all-cause mortality is, if anything, 25% lower, not higher, lower. And in those who have the lowest, uh, the majority of our cohort, they actually have a 50% reduced mortality. So if, I'd rather have no calcium than calcium, right? But if you're gonna have calcium, you gotta stay physically active. Now the EDS stuff, quite frankly, I think is mostly nonsense, to be honest with you. In fact, none of them have mutations. Uh, they all just have hypermobility. And if you do the genetics, my genetics guys have told us, please, please, please stop sending these patients for genetic testing because they're never abnormal. The vast majority of them do not have collagen mutations, even a VUS. So I think it's, um, and we, we've done these studies, the idea is that maybe their collagen and their vascular, is, uh, vascular system is more compliant, it's not. We don't see any greater pooling of blood below the heart, no greater increase in calf volume. So I, I'm not convinced that this is a real phenomenon. It's an association and that I think has been driven by patient advocacy and not by biology. We can talk about that later if you like. <laughs> yeah. Question about what happens to microcirculation. So is there a change in flow and flow reserve? And what is the capillary to myofibro ratio? Question is what happens to the microvasculature as you'd expect. Um, so, so we in, in our bed rest studies and in our early training studies, the microvasculature is also, I will say, physiologically very plastic. I don't know about the ultrastructure. We, we haven't done muscle biopsies on all these patients in these studies. But if you look at maximal vascular conductance, the maximal ability of the skeletal muscle microcirculation to dilate. And to do that, we put a cuff around the legs blow it up to 300 millimeters of mercury, and then exercise them, do this, right? Maximally exercise them, calves and anterior tib until they're, they're about to cramp and it's so painful. And then we lie them down and we measure the blood flow and we get um, increases in, in blood flow of 100 to 200 mLs per minute per 100 grams of tissue. It's a big flow. And we get 50% more, sometimes doubling of that with training and we get a 50% reduction with bed rest. So the ability of the microcirculation to vasodilate is just as plastic as everything else. But I, I can't tell you about the, uh, personally in our data, about the um, ultrastructure. Two, two very quick questions. You dig it, and Erica, and then we'll close it up. Uh, Dr. V uh, Levine, a very inspiring talk. I'm wondering, uh, the different types of sports like swimming, you increase preload, you enhance the compliance, and when you increase afterload, you also increase compliance. What are potential perspectives for like uh, swimming, maybe nitro oxide secretion, but the weightlifting more like testing sensitivity? What are your perspective about the sports and compliance? Yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting question, and that's why I showed you. I scooted through a lot of this stuff really fast and I apologize for that. But that's where if you want to, 
that's where this study comes in. And, and so I think that you're right in that all sports are not the same, right? Swimming has a more, uh, is done in the prone position. There's more preload. But I will say this, that when you exercise in the upright position, you reverse that gravitational gradient. When you swim, you don't get much more end diastolic volume because that's limited by the pericardium. So, so there are some nuances to how the heart adapts to different types of training. But if you think of this paradigm, that is the greater the endurance component, the greater the eccentric remodeling, the greater the static or strength component, the greater the, the concentric remodeling. And those interact together in sports like rowing, which is that upper right-hand corner, we have the biggest hearts and the most hypertrophic response. And all exercise is absolutely not the same. And it's a mistake to think about them as the same thing. The old Morgan Roth hypothesis about, you know, strength trained athletes have thick hearts and, and endurance trained athletes have dilated hearts is not really correct in part because I think the sports are almost always a combination of both. You never do almost just one thing. And so, um, I, I think that you've got to ask what is the various contribution of those different components and that helps you see what that ultimate adaptation is. Wanda, thank you. Dr. Spatz, it's the last question. Okay, real quick. Um, so American Heart Association, 150 minutes, moderate to vigorous exercise per week. You just heard us, your exercise prescription. You know, everybody is um, wear, has wearables um, and people want more personalized exercise prescriptions. Are we doing a disservice by, you know, watering it down? And based on your data, what would you say from a, you know, public health standpoint uh, perspective to really move the needle on um, physical activity and healthy aging? That's a great question, Eric. I think there are two parts to that question. The first is, I, I think that the wearables in the right people can be very uh, great inducement to let them know that they're not doing as much activity as they think they are and to help inspire them to do more. In many others, it makes them crazy, right? And, make, and, and, and I think we have done, in a lot of patients, we've made our done a disservice. You know, I, I don't wear one, you know? I, I don't need to know how many steps I'm taking. Uh, so I, I think that, that for some people, it just makes them nutty. And so what, my, my, when I talk to patients about what to do, I, I think that the, the guidelines are probably pretty accurate in terms of the maximal reduction in mortality that comes from the transition from sedentary to active lifestyle. So just getting people to be more active is really important. And I don't think it matters how you do that. What matters most is how do you integrate that into their daily lives? I tell my patients exercise has to be part of your personal hygiene like taking a shower or having breakfast, you know, it can't be something that you just add on. It has to be something that's part of your life. And, and those barriers, what is it that prevents it from becoming a part of your life is where, you know, your job is as a preventive cardiologist to figure that out. And I think that's different in different communities. You know, it's different in Dallas as it is in New Haven as it is in Seattle. So I think figuring out what those barriers are both in terms of geographic, socioeconomic opportunity make a big difference. But, but the, I will say one mistake is to assume that people who don't have access don't want to, right? So we did the activity counseling trial in Dallas, focusing on the community oriented primary care clinics in the most indigent areas of Dallas County. And, you know, look, we, we came up with maps of where the different malls were and how far around it was and what, how to get there. And people loved it. There's no, just because you don't have money doesn't mean you don't want to exercise. You just got to figure out what the barrier is. Thank you.